Sophia offered an abstract which was way too long for me to critically examine, and I did. We did kick off this um, project with a conference which actually coincided with Emily Jaster's major survey, which I had organized at the museum. And I did discuss some of those issues, but I will return to them and use this as an opportunity to return to some of those ideas, but also to think about one year on where I am emotionally and personally, because we all care about that, and what it also means to think about some of these issues now that I live in the United States. But these days, I really like to begin with kind of provocations or thought processes. So I'm going to start with one before I go into the, the presentation. To speak as an Arab, or indeed of being an Arab, is to speak of a perpetual exhaustion. It is an exhaustion that seeps through your veins and embodies your entire being. Constant strip and search, a body as a border, Obtained, detained, restrained. A constant performance of smile, look down, and try not to get caught while boarding an aeroplane, a border plane, the astro plane. It is a performance of attempting to ignore facts or ideas of colonization. Yes, I was once colonized, but now I am free when we all know very well that we are all still colonized. Not only is our imagination colonized by the ideology imposed upon, upon it from what the Western world, but equally from the dictators, the foreign agents, and forces who continue to purport that they will usher democracies into our worlds, our lives, only to lead us into endless, never-ending civil wars. Everything starts to feel like a dress rehearsal, a dress rehearsal for another conflict, another way of being. Those of us who, who live mostly in the diaspora, or at least the very least who have lived in it, can attest to the fact that we carry a weight, what Lebanese artist and poet Ital Adnan has called the weight of the world, the burden of representation and the deconstruction of that representation. Indeed, we are expected to deconstruct our whole histories for Western audiences in order to allow them to see us for what we really are. We must be content with bigotry and xenophobia from even the most so-called of liberal minds, who proclaim that we are oppressed and in need of freeing. In need of what kind of freedom, I ask? The freedom imposed by a reality TV star who can't even don his tope properly? Or the freedom to sit in a museum or gallery alongside artists from the Western canon without having to perform our otherness, to be told that we are as good or even better than them? Within this, I wish not to say that I think that we should depoliticize what it is that we think we can do, that this, this is not to say that art is not political, that art for art's sake is not political, that our work, our lives are not political. But whose politics are we meant to subscribe and speak to? And whose context are we trying to create? Context for Western audiences to look at us, or context again to be seen as we wish to see ourselves? I have been wrestling with these issues for my entire, perhaps short life. A life performed, a body across borders attempting to understand, to reconcile itself with the world around it. A world where my body is perpetually seen as a target, where I am always grabbed, searched, and interrogated as a male with brown eyes with a Sunni name. There are much worse cases, however, a Syrian refugee, a Palestinian without papers, or even in some cases, the Lebanese bourgeoisie. But still, my sense of time and place will always be one of contusing confusion. I left, I left, I left so many places. I have never returned. The reasons are too many to list here. But I want to stop now. I am tired of being forever tired. I am tired for having to defend why what I do is meaningful, why it is good, why it should be as important for you as it is for me. 
And indeed, it is this sense of exhaustion, this need that brought me here today, that drew me to Sultan al Qasimi to this project, to a friend whose generosity helped free me for a moment. Within the world of the Barjil Art Foundation, I was able to draw a map, a map that was wholly my own, in fact, and to start to create a world where I could truly start to see myself. And so I begin my summary towards an imperfect chronology. A question of definition which I posed at the beginning of this series of exhibition was, can we define art by, by geography or indeed the more conceptual notion of territory, the conceptual notion that spaces exist without, without real borders, spaces that are much more fluid than a geographic set that is defined by a political entity or border. And I raised the question, why should we do this? And is it a reductive or enabling tendency? Has the culture of the group show enabled us a power and ability to see artists who we couldn't traditionally see? Or has it hindered and flattened a whole part of the world? And I think it can operate in both ways. And as I outlined in the very beginning of this, of this year-long series of displays, I think that some projects very much seek to flatten and put things into a very specific binary mode of us and them. But there are others that create context, context for understanding this work. And I think it is important as we begin a day-long discussion to reiterate what the region is. The region is indeed that the Barjil Art Foundation collects the Arabic speaking world. It is a world bound by language, but is it a world bound by religion or ethnicity? Well, no, not necessarily, because there are numerous subsets of accents, a polyphony of religious and ethnic backgrounds within this space that has resulted from years of cross fertilization between borders. And when we talk about this space, it is important to recognize that we are within a constituent space that is bordered by Central Asia, South Asia, and the Caucasus. And one thing that I ask us to think about when we continually look and return to these works is that many of the artists who speak for and of this place have lived for the majority of their lives within this diaspora. So we must remember that. This is not, take a picture if you want to, 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 to look at this, but basically what I'm trying to say here is a series of provocations that will run throughout the day, which is when did, one of the questions that I was wrestling with when trying to put together this exhibition was, when did modernism begin in the Arab world and how did it lead us through a route to the contemporary? And indeed, what are the parameters by which we should define this space? What literature were we looking at in Arabic, in English, in German, in French? that was enabling us to tell these different histories. Indeed, who is history and what history were we negotiating? And the ultimate problem that I faced was this idea of synchronicity, hence the title Imperfect Chronology. And I will continually return to my friend and colleague Sophia Victorino, who in a cafe while we tried to figure out what this project would be, told me, you're really negotiating with the imperfection of the idea of chronology, with the impossibility that history, when put into chronological order, will tell us or reveal the truth about a specific place. Because the problem is, how do we determine when four artists dealt with the same subject at a specific moment in time, whose influence was more important when there may not have been literature around that specific moment, or indeed when there wasn't necessarily a context to determine who bore more influence on more artists. And indeed, who are the artists that shaped the canon and how was their significance determined was something that I was constantly trying to grapple with. And it's something that I still don't really know. So I see this, this year-long project, this exhibition in four parts, as a discursive proposition, one potential typology, methodology, whatever you want to call it, but it is by no means definitive. And I do not think that one collection can agree, and Sultan will agree with me, that we are not trying to be definitive here. We are trying to create one path or one route. And so the Whitechapel Gallery, a museum that has been here since 1901, that has been a museum of firsts. And so when I came, 
To propose this to the museum, I thought I looked at a number of different collections and I was drawn to the Bardul Art Foundation for a number of reasons and partly it was the generosity of the founder to open up those archives, to open up and let every single piece of that collection be queried and quizzed. And part of that generosity was releasing and trying to archive all of that information so that it was readily available online. And so we begun with chapter one, which we called Debating Modernism Part One, and we called it a kind of salon for art. And the reason that we called it a salon for art, or we need to think of it as a salon for art with over uh, almost 50 artists was because many of these artists' work was first seen in the Salon exhibition, uh, the annual exhibition, open call exhibition, or the Salon exhibition that emerged from the degree shows of the time, but also through the artist salons and communities where people would gather around specific collectors or groups of artists. And one of the ideas around this specific um, project taking place over the course of 16 months is that we wanted to build a community. We didn't want to do a one-off flash-in-the-pan exhibition of Arab art, but we wanted to engage a kind of specific temporality whereby the audience here would have the time to engage with a year-long discursive program of talks and debates, but also to think through what it would mean to come back and continually engage with this discourse over a period of time. And there are numerous organizations around the world that have kind of adopted this methodology. For example, the Artists Institute in New York was a big kind of thinking mode for me, an organization which literally spends an entire year or six months focusing on a specific artist, trying to unpack and measure that influence. But attempting to measure influence was a very challenging thing. So for example, look at this, these two images of the Aswan Dam at a moment where it was being built two years apart by Raghab Ayad and Afat Nagi. Which piece is more important and which piece tells a more authentic story? On the one side, you have builders trying to wrestle and to construct this entity. And on the other side, we see an abstraction. Whose artist, whose artist's work was seen more and whose was more important? Was it Afat Nagi because she came from a bourgeoisie family? Or was it Raghab Ayad because he was seen at a moment as being a male figure who was able to move into a much more male-dominated context? Mahmoud Saeed, whose early paintings were arguably mimetic of a European tradition, these landscape paintings are arguably within a whole genealogy of French painting, for example, became someone who over the course of his career and through looking at the Bargil Art Foundation's holding, developed a much more sophisticated and self-reflexive language where he became to critique and perhaps even poke fun at the orientalist imaginary that was kind of that he was imbricated in that was projected onto him and indeed he became an influence on many younger artists creating context for and looking at a whole different generation we looked, for example, at other people who were influenced by Mahmoud Saeed, such as Hamad Awais, and this piece was a very important piece because the first chapter, Debating Modernism Part One, really began at the turn of the 20th century, trying to look at the foundation of what an Arab art dialogue or history might be, what an aesthetic might be, and ended with the Arab-Israeli War which was very much emblematized in this specific painting, The Protector of Life from 67, 68, where here we see an upper Egyptian soldier containing within him and underneath him all of the different facets of rural Egyptian life. It was an optimistic proposition, you could say, but also perhaps one that was falsely optimistic. And within that, we also found the influence of Saeed again, in that he was someone who was believed to have discovered, or at least from a young age, someone like Injia Flatun, whose work we see, as Ivana mentioned last night, for those of you who were there, in the Centre Pompidou now, who was a part of a collective of individuals who were part of the Egyptian Surrealists, but also someone who was very much involved in, in, in a civil rights movement, who was imprisoned for being a woman at a time when women weren't allowed to protest in Egypt. And so that first specific exhibition or that first specific project was trying to put into conversation all of these complex social and historical things in a way that maybe des didn't necessarily help unpack or contextualize everything, but it tried to recreate 
create a sense of what the salon was, a sense of what the context might have been for how this work was absorbed at that specific time, and I hope offered an entry point for people to research and engage further. It also offered a point to think about who was forgotten. For example, artists such as Hassan Sharif from Sudan, who of this piece Dreamwalkers from 59, was much lesser known than Ibrahim Al Salahi, who was lucky enough to have a survey exhibition at the Tate Modern, but there were many others within this space, Ahmed Shibrin, for example, who we tried to bring in to this narrative, who we tried to say it isn't just these particular stars who have helped create this narrative, but many others. And within all of this space, I was trying to think about links across time, links across space. And I, this is a, a really dull map, but really is to say that these artists continue to move around the globe. For example, an artist like Shakir Hassan Saeed, an artist like Jawad Salim from Iraq, would go to Britain to study at the Slade, but then return to Iraq and to think about how they would create a culturally specific form or aesthetic that ultimately was still hindered or still challenged by the fact that their education had occurred within a Western context. As we moved into the realm of the contemporary, we started to see artists negotiating issues of memory, issues of how to contextualize their own recent past. So for example, Walid Rad's project, The Atlas Group, was, very, was a fictitious project that was trying to negotiate or trying to create a narrative itinerary as to what might have happened during the Lebanese Civil War. Maha Ma'amun's domestic tourism too pieced together literally thousands or hundreds of hours of kitsch documentary archival footage from Arab satellite TV of the Egyptian pyramids as the site or so-called seat of progress in this region and created the super kitsch melodrama as a way to critique the way that the Western gaze has been implanted onto the specific region. Or Akram Zatari's installation in chapter three, her and him Van Leo from 2001, sought to really unpack and unearth his work with the Arab Image Foundation, but also to create a historical context for, the, for studio photography in the context of the Arab world by looking at one specific figure, Van Leo, someone who became very much involved with unifying a whole set of people. And through a semi-fictitious narrative, he went on an itinerary where he interviewed this person, proclaiming that he was looking to understand the history of his aunt Nadia. As we move to the final display, chapter four, this is again an exhibition as in chapter three that is very much trying to negotiate and to think through this concept of memory, but specifically in relation to urban space and and to urban time, as I'd like to think about it. And this piece by Marwa Arsenios, all about Acapulco, which premiered in the Istanbul Biennial in 2011, seeks to reconstitute this very specific space, this tourist resort that had once been a site of congregation, a site of something potentially romantic, where she recreated this odd building in this maquette form and gathered together advertising for that specific beach resort, Acapulco. Documentary photographs and archival material alongside video footage and created an immersive installation to try and give you an inside sense of what this space might have looked like. And that becomes a jumping off point to look at works by Etel Adnan, Iman Isa, Lawrence Abu Hamdan, and Jumana Manna, who are all negotiating this concept of memory in relation to urban space. And so, what you come to with this whole series of exhibitions is is not only what I try to preface with this sense of what it means to be an Arab in the 21st century, it was really about creating a context of what it meant to look at Arab art within its own historic genealogy, without trying to consistently revolve it around socio-political topics that were 
very much constructed around the idea of the Western gaze, but very much trying to look at, in context, what were the movements and shifts that led to us thinking about particular things, that led us to thinking about what, where did the modern begin and where did the contemporary begin, but ultimately left us with an open-ended question. There is no answer here. This is but one mere proposition. I leave this open for you to contest and to debate. I am happy for you to tear this apart in whichever way that you please. I'm happy for you to tell me that my, my idea of history and my historiogra histori historiographical approach was incorrect because I was struggling against trying to find literature, a literature which was limited in the languages that I could speak, which were English and Arabic. So with that, I leave you as a provocation or an opening thought process to this day. And I'm going to hand over to Hannah Feldman, who will talk to us, I, I suppose, no, sorry, to Dina Ramadan, excuse me, who will talk to us about the School of Fine Arts in Egypt. Thank you.